Welcome to another edition of the Morning Devotional. My name is Pastor William Hill, the pastor of Providence Presbyterian Church located in Evansville, Indiana. We are a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America. If you'd like to find out more information about the church, you can visit our website. That information will be available to you at the end of this devotional. Today is Thursday, October 5th, 2023. This is edition number 171 of season 8. We are still looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith. Today we come to the final paragraph of chapter 30, uh, paragraph number 4, dealing with matters related to church censures. Let's pray first, and then we'll consider this final paragraph in this chapter. Father, as we continue looking at this very important matter of discipline within the life of your church, one of the marks of a true church, we pray that you would give us insight and understanding, and that you would guide us in all truth, that your spirit would guide and direct us and help us. We pray that you'd forgive us for our many sins and ask that you'd help us to walk according to your ways and your truth. Grant us your spirit now, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, we complete this chapter dealing with matters related to church censures by dealing with the censures itself here in paragraph number four, which reads, for the better attaining of these ends, the officers of the church are to proceed by admonition suspension from the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for a season and by excommunication from the church according to the nature of the crime and demerit of the person. Now, we have here given to us in this paragraph three specific elements that relate to the matters of church censure, these matters that are otherwise known as matters uh, related to church discipline. The paragraph begins for the better attaining of these ends. Well, the better attaining of these ends has to do with the things that were just stated in paragraph number three. Church censures are necessary for the reclaiming and gaining of offending brethren, for deterring of others from the like offenses, for purging out of that leaven which might infect the whole lump, for vindicating the honor of Christ and the holy profession of the gospel and for preventing the wrath of God, which might justly fall upon the church. Now, these items that are, we're going to discuss in turn are what is referenced in paragraph number four, for the better attaining of these ends, these things that I just read from paragraph number three. The officers of the church are to proceed to three specific items. We're going to just deal with these three things within the confines of um, the ecclesiastical polity of the PCA. There are other aspects dealing with officers in the church and, and various other sundry things that relate directly to these three things, but that's not that important to cover uh, for a wider audience. But let's just look at a couple of passages of Scripture before I make comments related to each one of these. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, there we read, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, in verse number 6, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not accord with the tradition that you received from us. And then verses 14 and 15 of the same chapter. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And then that classic passage, I just preached through this. I'm preaching through 1 Corinthians in the morning worship service here at Providence, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And then in verse 13, God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. One more passage from Matthew chapter 18. And in verse number 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. These things highlight for us the three aspects of church discipline or the censures of the church, which are used to better attain those matters that are given in paragraph number three. The first one is admonition. This is the lowest form of discipline within the life of the church. It's a, it is that discipline or that censure that is given to the 
to the one who is penitent of his sin or at least acknowledges his sin. And he is then therefore warned by the officers of the church. And uh, I take that to mean the elders of the church that are uh, charged with the spiritual well-being and oversight of the members of the church to judge their behavior and to assess their spiritual, their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. They are to admonish them to be more careful in the future against relapses into this particular sin. They may even give them things to do. They may even assign them certain responsibilities uh, for means of accountability. They may prevent them from doing certain things in this process of admonition, but they are, in fact, admonished for their behavior. Now, this is the lowest form, again, as I've said, the lowest point of discipline, but it is discipline. It is a formal act of Christ to the person. In fact, all of these acts are acts of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so far as they're done faithfully according to the Word of God, they are all acts of the Lord Jesus Christ toward the offending individual. The next uh, level of discipline is suspension from the sacraments of the Lord's Supper for a season. Now, in the PCA, that suspension from the sacraments would also include baptism. Um, it's not often mentioned in, in, uh, in, in the confines of this uh, particular act of discipline. Suspension typically is referencing sus uh, a barring from the Lord's table for a season. But the sacrament of baptism, of course, would come into play as well. If they had a child who was seeking to be baptized, they would be prevented from presenting that child for baptism. But be that as it may, they are suspended from the sacrament of the Lord's Supper because they are not penitent. There is a gross lack of repentance over their sin. They refuse to acknowledge their sin. They refuse to repent of their sin. And so they are suspended from the sacraments for a season so that the elders of the church may pastorally work with them, hoping and pleading with them to repent that they might not incur the greatest censure which follows that censure of excommunication from the church. Now, excommunication from the church has had much debate over the years, I suspect, and not really sure why this is such a problem. But when a person comes to the church and they want to join the church, they are required to make a credible profession of faith. They are to state that they are trusting and leaning upon Christ alone and His righteousness, not their own. They are to offer a credible profession of faith. That is to say that the things that they say about their trust in Christ equals their lives. Let me see if I can illustrate. So if a person came to the church and wanted to join Providence and they stated the right information, the facts of the matter of the gospel, but I knew or have knowledge that they are living in sin with, a, with either a woman or a man, um, then that would not be a credible profession of faith. There needs to be some change of lifestyle. There needs to be a sense in which they recognize as a Christian that this is sinful and they need to cease and desist that life. But in general, people come, they offer a credible profession of faith, and they are welcomed gladly by their own word. Uh, we take them at their word. We cannot see their heart. And we receive them into the fellowship, into the communion of Christians the communion and fellowship of believers locally represented at this church. However, if their behavior begins to prove that their profession of faith is invalid, then we work through these matters of church censure or discipline. And if we arrive at the matter of excommunication, the, the session as they stated when they received them as Christians, remember paragraph number two, they have the power respectively to retain and remit sins, to shut that kingdom against the impenitent, both by the word and censures, and to open it unto penitent sinners. In this case, the elders are able and should apply the keys of the kingdom, using the keys of the kingdom, and shut the kingdom to a man who will not repent of his sin. Now, the Christian life is a life of repentance. Every single day, you and I sin in thought, word, and deed. That's a simple truth. That's a fact. But the question is, what are we doing with it? We need to be repenting of sin, that we might not let sin run our lives. Nobody is ever excommunicated from the church for the sin that they've committed in particular. But they are, in fact, excommunicated from the church when they refuse to repent of known sin, and they refuse to deal with it as biblically confronted by the elders of the church and the word of God. 
Now, what does it mean to be excommunicated? It means that they go back into the status of which they were prior to coming to the church to begin with. And that is simply to say that the elders of the church are now declaring under the authority of Christ the King and the head of the church that this individual is no longer a believer. This is a very serious step, a very serious matter, and a very serious declaration on behalf of the under-shepherds of Christ's church to the impenitent sinner. And so, of course, it's the greatest censure. It is the most severe of all the censures. And that is something that I pray I will never have to do. Now, in my seven years of ministry, I've never had to excommunicate an individual uh, together with my elders. I have uh, suspended. I have suspended ruling elders uh, together with my other elders. I have suspended members of the church. I have had to uh, admonish a member of the church together with my other elders on particular matters. These things have happened in my ministerial life over the last seven years or so. But I have never, by God's grace, I have never been placed in a situation in which I've been compelled uh, together with my other elders. I cannot do this on my own. No pastor has this authority on his own. But together with my other elders, I've never been in that situation in which I've ever had to do that. I pray I never will. And so these are the means or the means to attain the ends that are given to us in paragraph number three. And they are very serious, but they are, again, designed. All of them are designed to reclaim the offending sinner to promote the glory of God and the honor of Christ in His church and the purity of His church. And we always need to remember that when we're thinking about church discipline. Lots of people will say, well, church discipline is mean, it's not loving, it's not caring of the person in the center. That is simply not a true statement whatsoever. Church discipline always works. Now, you might think, well, I know people who were disciplined who never came back to the church and they died in unbelief. Well, that may be true. But the fact remains that the discipline worked. Why? Because it maintained the glory of God and the purity of Christ's church and the glory of Christ. It always does what it's supposed to do. Whether it actually uh, retains the offending brother or sister is another discussion. But the fact remains that church discipline always works. Now, I have seen it work in other matters, other cases, not my own, with people who after a period of time, years have gone by, the Lord in His grace and kindness reclaims that sinner. Because in fact, if they do belong to Him, He will not let them wander forever. He will not lose them. He will discipline them Himself, Hebrews chapter 12, and He will bring that person to their senses and they will repent of that sin that led to the excommunication, and they will be restored to the church. And in fact, that is exactly what we should do when a person is admonished or suspended or even excommunicated. When they repent, when they show contrition, when there are fruits of repentance in their lives, we are to welcome them and to love them as brothers or sisters in the Lord. And so this completes uh, this uh, particular uh, chapter, chapter number 30 on church censures, a very important chapter. It's one of the marks of the church, and we ought to be doing these things to the glory of our great Savior. Well, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave me a note. The way to reach me is there before you on the screen. And so until the Friday edition, when we uh, look at chapter 31, we begin chapter 31. May the Lord help you today. May you serve Him and walk according to His ways. God bless.